Hello, my name is Dr. Mary Cook and I have the great privilege to both live and work in Stirling. I'm the Council's archaeologist and my main job is to comment on the archaeological implications of planning applications. But I'm an active researcher in the area and I've dug on both the Stirling Bridge and the Bannockburn Battlefields. Now, um, I'm not a poet or a historian. Um, I am just someone who reads poetry. No, it's not that weird. I'm also very interested in how the wars of independence have been portrayed over time in poetry and song and how that's changed. My inspiration for this lecture is the book by Robert Crawford, Bannockburns, which I heartily recommend. So, the plan today, I'm going to introduce and explain the context of seven poems and songs from across the 723 years from Wallace's great victory at Stirling Bridge to today. Many you will know, some you won't. I'm going to give you links to where you can get them. There will be some readings, not too many, I promise you, just the good bits. Um, the poems are Robert Baston's The Battle of Bannockburn, 1314. It's a contemporary account. Now, the version I'm going to quote from is by Edwin Muir, which was commissioned for the reopening of the Scottish Parliament. But the link I'm going to give you is to a less poetic but more accurate version. John Barber's The Bruce, 1375. First major work in poem, uh, in Scots, an epic poem about the life of the Bruce. Blind Harry's Wallace, 1475. One of the first books published in Scotland and, of course, the inspiration for Braveheart. Robert Burns, Scots Wahey only fully published under his name after his death in 1799. Walter Scott, Lord of the Isles, 1815. William Sinclair, The Battle of Stirling Bridge, 1861. You definitely don't know this one. Um, commissioned, or rather it won a prize for the best song uh, and it was to be sung at a banquet for the to accompany the laying of the foundation stone for the Wallace Monument in 1861. The Corries, um, Flower of Scotland, 1967. You all know that. Right. Finally, I'd like to recommend another one, one that you buy. De Murray, an epic companion poem in Scots and English on the life and times of Sir Andrew de Murray, hero of the wars of Scottish independence by my friend Paddy McNeil, the Gaelic bard from Dunblane. Now, uh, the poems I've picked are obviously the obvious ones. Um, I know them, I suspect you know some of them. Um, there are clearly going to be more, but the fact that uh, I don't know about them makes me suggest that they are not worth knowing. Um, this, however, makes a serious point. I can find nothing between Blind Harry's Wallace, written in 1477, and Scots Wahey in 1799. Dunbar, Lindsay, Buchanan, Johnson, Watt, uh, Ramsay, Ferguson. The greats of medieval and post-medieval Scots poetry do not write about Bannockburn. Um, certainly write about the Romans, so for example Arthur Johnson's wonderful elegy for Stirling from the 1630s. Who can do Stirling justice, cradle of kings who set their castles strong on its high ridge? But Stirling's fame in war is even more worth epic celebration. More than once this place repelled the spears of Rome. Its river commanded Rome's imperial ego, stop. Wonderful stuff. But if anyone is aware of any good poems, please let me know. Now, this absence might be because of the Blind Harry filled the gap. It was, after all, the most popular book in Scotland for 300 years. However, perhaps the elite considered Bruce and Wallace unfashionable or parochial, um, not worth celebrating. Um, better to focus on the Romans than the English. Perhaps this was because it was too sensitive. Uh, perhaps a little bit of realpolitik. However, we were generally always at war with English, the English, and uh, James IV was happy to use the massive, if fake, Wallace sword as a propaganda symbol. Uh, George Buchanan certainly drew on the legal arguments from the wars. The Declaration of our Broth is per is pivotal in the deposition of Mary Queen of Scots. His books are banned by James VII for fear that they would lead to his deposition, as indeed he was. Um, so the absence of Bruce and Wallace from poetry and song is odd. Right, before we go on, we need some timeline. Um, 
The Wars of Independence, that S is very important. We fought the English, other Scots, the Welsh, the Irish. Uh, the wars lasted for 60 years, the First and Second Wars of Independence. Um, brutal period. So, death of Alexander III in 1286, the last Canmore. Um, his little granddaughter, the maid of Norway, also dies. There is no male heir, there is no heir. Um, the main aristocratic families in Scotland are all related to each other, but they cannot decide who has the best claim. The two main families, of course, are the Bruces and the Balliols. They both invite Edward I to help adjudicate the process. He uses this to uh, claim to be the feudal superior of Scotland and appoints Balliol. Balliol has the strongest claim, but is arguably the weakest candidate. He, Edward then demands that we support his wars in France. We refuse. This uh, ends in the Battle of Dunbar, 1296. We lose. Scotland ceases to be a legal entity. It, it's an argument that can be made. Um, the rebellion begins the next year, the Battle of Stirling Bridge. Uh, a massive Scottish victory. Wallace knighted. Battle of Falkirk, 1298. We lose. Again, Edward back in control. There is a brief... Um, Resurgence 1304, 1303, 1304, um, but it fizzles out. 1304 peace treaty, um, 1304 uh, obviously has the Warwolf siege of Stirling Castle, tremendous um, effort, the largest trebuchet ever built potentially. Um, Wallace is singled out or is specifically excluded and his capture is a, a term of the 1304 Peace Treaty, which Bruce and Common cravenly um, agree to. Uh, 1305, Wallace is is brutally executed. Um, 1306, Bruce crowned. Um, a long time after that, 1314, think about those years, the Battle of Bannockburn, two battles, uh, day one, day two, against Edward II. Edward I died by this point. Treaty of Edinburgh 1328, the peace. Um, now, this isn't really because Edward II has given up, it's because he's been deposed by his French wife. Um, Bruce dies 1329, Second Wars of Independence 1332. Um, Edward II's son is in charge, he's kicked out his mum. Edward III, the franchise rebooted. Um, this also involves the son of Balliol, another Edward, Edward I of Scotland. He is crowned at Schoon um, in a ceremony every bit as illegitimate as Bruce's, but nobody wanted him, so he got booted out. So, remember, 60 years of war, two Scottish kings, uh, Robert the Bruce, then his son David II, and three English kings, Edward I, Edward II, Edward III, quite a lot of war. The first poem, Robert Baston, the Battle of Bannockburn, originally in Latin. Now, Robert Baston was Edward II's poet, brought on campaign to record his stupendous, amazing, absolute victory against the rebellious Scots who would be crushed. Hmm. That went well. Um, Balliol was captured, uh, not Balliol, goodness me, Baston was captured by Bruce and released after composing the poem. The poem is a contemporary account, features lots of interesting first-hand details, but significantly is a sober reflection on the horrors of war. The best detail it regards day two. Right. What snatching and catching, what bruising and bruceling, what grief, what war horns and warmings, what windings and wearying no relief, what slashing and slaughtering, what wounding and wailing, what a rout, what lurking and lunging, what grabbing and groaning, what a turn about, what roaring and rearing, what shrinking and shaking, what lassoing, what cloaking and collecting, what snipping and snacking, what undoing, bellies will be empty, both broadswords and bodies are booty, so many fatherless children to clutch at futurity. Little note there, bodies are booty. In addition to capturing live nobles, live English nobles, to be ransomed back. Uh, corpses were also um, ransomed in order to fund the future war against England. Now the conclusion. 
I cannot remember the humblings and tumblings of hundreds that fall. Many are mown down, many are thrown down, many are drowned, many are found and bound. Many are taken in chains for a stated ransom. So some are rising, riding, rich, high and handsome, who before the war were poor and threadbare souls. The battlefield is barren, but piled with spoils. Shouts and taunts and vengeful cuts and brawls. I saw, but what can I say? A harvest I did not sow. Guile is not my style. Justice and peace are what I would show. Anyone who has more in store, let him write the score. My mind is numb, my voice hath dumb, my art a blur. I am a Carmelite, my surname is Baston. I grieve that I survive a happening so harrowing and ghastly. If it is my sin to have left out what should be in, let others record it without rumour or spin. Very good stuff. Barber's Bruce, written 60 odd years after the events, the first major work in Scots, clearly pro-Bruce propaganda, events changed and the timeline is out and it doesn't mention Wallace, who was clearly embarrassing the Bruce for years to come. It's full of interesting details. The older garden before the King's Knot is called the Round Table, referring to Arthurian legend, obviously. The small folk are in the New Park, probably Coxet Hill. Gillies Hill is not mentioned. Just to remind you, on day two of Bannockburn, the appearance of the camp followers or small folk to the west of the English army between them and the castle has a dramatic impact. The English think they're a fresh force and a defeat becomes a rout. The most astonishing victory in Scottish history ever, full stop, honest governor. Um, now, as I say, this is the first major work in Scots, so it can be hard going. But if you declaim it uh, with full passion and vigour, hopefully you will grasp the meaning, right? That of them, a full grit party, fled to the water of Forth, and there, the mast part of them, down it war, and bonnock burn betwixt the braes of men and horse, so a stick it was, that upon drown it horse and men, men make past dry out o'er it then. Uh, no, um, a translation, you you cry. Okay, um, that of them, a full great party, fled to the water of Forth, and there the most part of them drowned, and bannock burn between the braes was full of men and horses, that over their corpses people could pass dry shod. Oh, horrible. Well worth reading, the whole thing, but as I say, if your Scots isn't good, it's hard. There is, of course, lots of translations, so uh, good luck with that. Right, Blind Harry's Wallace, uh, 1477, so obviously not a first-hand account. Um, one of the first books printed in Scotland. It has at least 23 editions. The most popular book in Scotland after the Bible, a version banned by Napoleon. Now, the version I use is by, the translation rather, by William Hamilton of Gilbertfield, published in 1722, probably as a response to the Act of Union in 1707. Um, and in particular, the version I use is uh, produced and introduced by our friend Elspeth King, late of the Smith, well worth buying. Um, now this is violently anti-English, um, not very accurate. It is clearly recording oral traditions that have built up about Wallace after the wars and clearly describes medieval Scotland. It is also tremendous fun and, of course, the basis of Braveheart. Now, chapter one sets the book's tone after Wallace vows to avenge the death of his fictitious wife. And it's grim. The sword I'll never sheath till I revenge my dearest, dearest death. Heavens, what new toils of death and war remain, rivers of floating blood and hills of slain, but steeled with rage to slaughter let us fly, and for her sake there shall ten thousand die. Now, um, perhaps the most egregious element of Blind Harry is his portrayal of Bruce, who he has fighting for the English at Falkirk Bridge. This is based on contemporary anti-Bruce propaganda. Though while he did not fight on the English side, he also did not fight for the Scots. And of course, remember, in the 1304 uh, peace treaty, he's acquiesced in the craven surrender and singling out of, of Wallace. 
one of the few to be excluded from Edward the First Peace, which obviously leads to his horrific execution. That's the context for Harry's portrayal of the meeting of the two after the battle on the banks of Carron. And Wallace says, The tears came trickling from his eyes. Thou that should be our true and righteous king, destroyed thy own, a cruel and horrid thing. This uh, has a deep impact on Bruce. Um, and after being so shamed, he rushes to Linlithgow without thinking. He's attending the English victory feast and he hasn't washed himself, uh, which embarrasses even Edward I. Oh, goodness me, how horrific. Now, Bruce sitting down in his own vacant seat, called for no water but went straight to meat. Though all his weapons and his other weed were stained with blood, yet he began to feed. The southern lords did mock him in terms rude, and said, Behold, yon Scot eats his own blood. Ooh. It's this, and a further meeting with Wallace that sets Bruce back on the right track. Now, that does make sense. It, it allows a kind of uh, Bruce to come to his senses. It just didn't happen. Um, Bruce doesn't regret anything. Um, he's a violent military genius with a dominant coming like ability to plot and spin. He only sided with Scotland when it suited him. Remember that. Right. Now, we're moving into the, the modern era now. And um, these poems have, well, like the MTS Rotunda, have very little to say about the reality of the battle. They reflect contemporary views and social mores. Scots Way by Burns. This was inspired by a visit to the Borstow and uh, is meant to be Bruce's speech to the troops on day one of the battle. Um, unfortunately, the Borstone is likely to be a dropped millstone and day one didn't take place here. But still go to the NTS Visitor Centre um, and enjoy it. Um, the poem is easily one of the best ever written in Scotland and was only fully published under his name after his death. Why? Right, it's so good, I'm going to uh, read the whole thing. I'm not going to sing it, don't worry, my dulcet tones won't offend your ears. Scots wahe where Wallace bled, Scots wan Bruce has often led, welcome to your gory bed or to victory. Now's the day and now's the hour, see the frontal battle lower, see approach proud Edward's power, chains and slavery. Wa will be a traitor knave, wa can fill a coward's grave, wa say base is be a slave, let him turn and flee. Wa for Scotland's king and law, freedom's sword will strongly draw, freemen stand or freemen fall, let him follow me. By oppressions, woes and pains, by your sons in servile chains, we will drain our dearest veins, but they shall be free. Lay the proud usurpers low, tyrants fall in every foe, liberties in every blow, let us do or die. Brilliant stuff. Wow, yes. Now, <laughs> what's, that, what's wrong with it? What's so dangerous? Uh, it's about freedom. Who could possibly object? And of course, you've guessed it, your smart cookies. It's that last sand stanza. Let's go over it. Lay the proud usurpers low. The Hanoverians have usurped the Stuarts. They're the current royal family. Oh, tyrants fall in every foe. A reference to the American Revolution. Liberties in every blow. Oh, let's the French Revolution. Let us do or die. Is this a call to arms? Oh, now remember, um, the Radical War, the Radical Revolt, 1820, is not far away from this point. Um, Baird and Hardy, the leaders, are found guilty of treason. They are executed. They are beheaded, the last beheadings in Britain, 200 years ago this year. Except because it's the 19th century, it's a more um, civilised age, they're hanged first and then their corpses are decapitated. And remember, the axe is in the smith. This is a dangerous, seditious poem. Um, but think about it again. There's nothing about the battle here. There's no detail. It, it draws upon it, but it doesn't describe it. Right. Walter Scott and the Lord of the Isles. Now, in the immediate aftermath of the Napoleonic campaigns, 
there is an absolute fascination for the great British battlefields, right? And this one, remember, is written, it's published a year after the anniversary in 1814. Um, and both Stirlingbridge and Bannockburn, right, are benefiting from this upsurge in interest. Um, Walter Scott capitalises on this. Uh, remember, he is a publishing phenomenon. He publishes his way out of debt. He is the most popular novelist in the world, potentially. Um, now, as with his earlier Lady of the Lake, uh, the poem is written with real landscapes in mind, which are intertwined with history and myth to create the traditional tartan biscuit tin image so beloved of our tourism industry. Now, as the man himself said, Oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. But let me be clear, right? I really like Scott and I like his poetry more than ever after having uh, read some of it for the first time. But I'm always going to prefer Hogg. And I am stating for the record, Memoirs and Confessions of a Justified Sinner, best Scottish novel ever, full stop. Right. It's Scott that first popularises the link of the small folk to Gilly's Hill. The poem is basically Barber's Bruce, but written with a better rhythm. So here is the approach of the English army on day one. Beyond the southern host appears a boundless wilderness of spears, strove far but strove in vain to spy. Thick flashing in the evening beam, glaives, lances, bills, and banners gleam. And where the heaven joined with the hill, was the distant armour flashing still, so wide so far, the boundless host seemed in the blue horizon lost. Oh, a very evocative. Now, even better is the description of de Boon's charge on day one. So de Boon is, uh, or was, an English knight at the leading edge of the vanguard. Bruce is between the vanguard and his own troops. He's out front, steadying their nerve, presumably declaiming Scots way. He's caught out. If he turns and runs back to his own lines, it's a humiliation, massive loss of morale. But if he's caught and killed, the battle is over. Now, this is an inc this really is an incredible moment in Scottish history. Uh, astonishing, um, nerve tingling uh, moment. It's ultimately the most famous square goal in Scottish history. So, Barber's Bruce describes it. It's the same scene, uh, same beats, rhythms, really. Um, but Scott, to my mind, significantly improves it and extends it, right? He spurred his steed, he couched his lance and darted on the Bruce at once. As motionless as rocks that bide the wrath of the advancing tide, the Bruce stood fast, each breast beat high and dazzled what she was each gazing eye. The heart had hardly time to think, the eyelid scarce had time to wink. While on the king, like flash of flame, spurred to full speed, the war horse came. The partridge may the falcon mock, if that slight palfrey stand the shock. But swerving from the king's career, just as they met, Bruce shunned the spear. Onward the baffled warrior bore, his course his soon, his course was o'er. High in his stirrups stood the king, and gave his battle axe the swing. Right on de Boon, the whiles he passed, fell that stern dint, the first, the last. Such strength upon the blow was put. The helmet crashed like hazelnut, the axe shaft with its brazen clasp, which shivered to the gauntlet grasp, springs from the blow the startled horse, drops to the plain the lifeless corpse. First of that fatal field, how soon, how sudden, fell the fierce taboon. One pitying glance the monarch sped, where on the field his foe lay dead, then gently, gently turned his palfrey's head, and pacing back his sober way, slowly he gained his own array. The rounds are king, the leaders crowd, and blamed his recklessness aloud, that risk gazed each adventurous spear, a life so valued and so dear. His broken weapon shaft surveyed, the king a careless answer made, my loss may pay my folly's tax, I've broken my trusty battle axe. <laughs> I, I, that's a good line, surely, worth a chuckle. Um, Oh yes, there is a there is a great rhythm and motion to that, and it captures everything and um, brilliant. Right, William Sinclair, the Battle of Stirling Bridge. Now, William was a journalist in a paper called the Stirling Journal, and his song, as you've heard, was the winner of a competition uh, for a song to be sung at the banquet 
for the laying of uh, the foundation stone of the Wallace Monument. Apparently it was very, very popular back in the day. Um, completely forgotten. A Google search does not reveal it. Um, now I'm not going to read it all, uh, just a few points. Obviously there's a copy earlier on, you can read that if you want. And it's worth noting that at the time they thought the battle uh, was at Kildeen near the college. Hmm. So there was an excellent bloody paragraph in the middle. The foemen fell on every side, in crimson hues the fourth was dyed, bedewed with blood the heather, while shouts triumphant shook the air, thus shall we do, thus shall we dare, wherever Scotsmen gather. Um, that's okay, that's okay. Finally, the conclusion uh, contains an unintentional but not bad double entendre. See if you can spot it, and, and I may give it away, I, I apologise. Though years like shadows fleet, or the dial stone of time, thy pulse of freedom still shall beat. With the throb of manhood's prime, still shall the valour, love and truth that shone on Scotland's early youth from Scotland ne'er dissever. The shamrock rose and thistle stern shall wave around her Wallace cairn and bless the brave forever. Now, uh, apologies for my um, giggle in the middle. Um, importantly with this poem, we now have an explanation of why, when Scotland was never more secure in Britain, did it feel the need to erect the largest ever symbol of independence ever, i.e. the National Wallace Monument, which incidentally is the biggest monument to an individual in Britain. And it, it's obvious, for the best part of a thousand years England and Scotland fought each other. We are now at peace and we took over the world. So Britain is Scotland in partnership with England in empire. Now the same sentiment uh, for me is better expressed by Charles Mackay, another um, Sterling poet, um, and he says, and though no longer foes are the thistle and the rose, but in love intertwined with Erin Shamrock joined in prosperity, in valour and in worth. Now significantly neither of these poems imagine a role for the Welsh what what's going on? Um, anyway, <laughs> so the quarries we're coming to the end. Now, who hasn't sung this? Um, then, after rugby matches in the pub up the street, it's great stuff. It's supposed to be all about Bannockburn, right? Yeah, but have you read it? Um, it mentions an Edward, but which one? Remember, there are three. Um, it talks of wee bits of hill and glen, but not nobles and knights. Um, those hills are bare now? Mmm, a clue there. I think it's about the um, the clearances, obviously. And it's linking the clearances to the Wars of Independence. I think there's an allusion to uh, such a parcel of rogues in the nation, because the hills and glen have been betrayed. Anyway, um, certainly the song describes a peasant revolt against an aggressive English king. It's perhaps more in keeping with Wallace and Stirling Bridge, or perhaps the uh, small folk at the end of day two. Anyway, regardless, the Edward in question could be any one of them. All three were chased out of Scotland to think again. Right? On the other hand, we've still got this the second element. We can still rise now and be a nation again. It mourns the loss of independence and recalls the spirit of Bruce and the small folk to win it back perhaps again doffing a cap to Scots Wahey, all very different to Sinclair and Scott. Now, so, some conclusions. As time passes, um, the accuracy of the poems and the songs declines, and they focus more on glory than the savage barbarity of war. And there's always a political point to be made. Um, focusing on Blind Harry's Wallace, uh, this is a brilliant and bloody, vitriolic piece of anti-English propaganda. The Wallace that emerges is a savage but honourable killing machine. He is a Jack Reacher, a Shane. Every character played by John Wayne, Clint Eastwood and Sylvester Stallone all rolled into one, right? Yeah. Um, this does the, the real man a disservice. He was so very much more than a kind of two-dimensional killing machine. He was an incredible, absolutely astonishing individual to rise from such humble beginnings to become de facto king. He is perhaps the greatest ever Scot. Um, 
he and his few close band of brothers stood alone for Scotland when all others, including Bruce, had given up. So for me, he is our Bonhoeffer, our Churchill, our Vercingetorix, our Washington, our Atticus Finch, our Nelson Mandela. Um, it's therefore entirely appropriate that Blind Harry's account was the most popular book in Scotland. Um, but who he is depends on what we look to him for, what we project from ourselves to him. Now this gets clearer through the 19th and 20th centuries as the politics become ever sharper, so the detail vanishes. Scots were hay and flower of Scotland, both vivid, brilliant and bright calls for independence. But the Bruce and Wallace they draw on are thin and ethereal. Uh, the concepts of freedom over slavery it's basically motherhood and apple pie. Who could ever disagree? They're not, they're not contentious issues. And remember, um, Sinclair and Scott also celebrated freedom, a golden past of not bending the knee that allowed us to become worthy partners in empire with England, our glorious global spanning manifest destiny. And of course, we avoided the fate of the Welsh. Um, this was a vision of noble, honourable, white male heroes, albeit Catholic, glossed over, uh, doing daring deeds. People knew their place, things were black and white. Our imperial destiny outshone the massacres and the theft. So, I'm not alone in criticising Scott. Um, famously, Mark Twain blamed him for the violent nature of the American Civil War. And he says, so Walter Scott, with his enchantments, and by his single might checks this wave of progress, and even turns it back, sets the world in love with dreams and phantoms, with decayed and swinish forms of religion, with decayed and degraded systems of government, with the silliness and emptiness, sham grandeurs, sham gods, sham chivalries of a brainless and worthless long-vanished society. Hey, that's Scotland! Um, he goes on to say, he did measureless harm, more real and lasting harm, perhaps, than any other, other individual that ever wrote. Wow, now that really is harsh. Uh, too harsh, perhaps? Well, you might like to note that the Ku Klux Klan adopted the Burning Cross from Scots Lady of the Lake. Anyway, for me, uh, the Scottian view of Wallace and Bruce dies in the trenches of World War I, with so many other things. We go from Newbold's play up, play up, and play the game, to Owens, the old lie, dulce decorum est pro patria mori. But is Braveheart any more ethical or any more accurate? So finally, I would encourage you all to read and enjoy these poems and songs and really give Scott a chance. Um, it is, he is worth it. Um, but please remember the history and not the beautiful rhetoric. Thank you very much. So, welcome back. Uh, you were asked to submit questions. Um, three people did so. The questions are, uh, what has been your favourite discovery in Stirling so far as Stirling's archaeologist and why? Well, that's easy. Um, that's the Roman Iron Age fort uh, in Kings Park. It's a 2000 year old elite defended settlement, the inhabitants of which traded with the Roman Empire when Stirling was kind of at that critical junction point, the Antonine Wall to the south, uh, people to the north. The people in the north have cattle, grain, timber, all the things that the Romans want. They trade with the people. People around Stirling facilitate the exchange and get rich of it. Um, it's my favorite because I found it. Um, it's the period of my PhD, the period I'm most interested in. And, um, it's 10 minutes from my house, so <laughs> obvious really. Um, now, second question is, what is my opinion on how accurate the depictions of Bruce and Wallace were in Braveheart? Well, um, as you've heard, uh, Braveheart is basically Blind Harry's Wallace. Blind Harry's Wallace is written uh, 1477, so 100 and, uh, 120, 130 years after the events. Um, not very accurate. 
Um, I think that Bruce comes out worse. Um, he's a cowardly daddy's boy. Is it his dad or his granddad that has leprosy skulking away? Um, in reality, um, Bruce wasn't a coward. He was certainly craven. He is a brilliant, ruthless military genius. He comes from a long line of cynical nobility. Um, they do what's good for the Bruce family. Um, remember, he uh, acquiesces in the 1304 Peace Treaty, a condition of which is the capture and surrender of uh, Wallace for his um, uh, kind of horrific execution at Smithfield. Um, I think that Wallace is a kind of um, an even more bloody killing machine in the film. I think that this actually downplays him. Um, I think that um, he, well obviously Mel Gibson is smaller and older uh, than, than Wallace is supposed to be. Um, I think that uh, Falkirk undermines his military reputation. I'm always in two minds about this. I think um, Stirling Bridge was luck, but he capitalised on it. Um, that's good. I think Falkirk wasn't meant to be a set-piece battle. I think it was meant to be cat and mouse drawing uh, Edward I deeper and deeper into Scotland, draining his resources, attacking him from the sides. Um, I don't see uh, any other way. I, I think Wallace was astonishing. I mean, he's basically no one and he becomes de facto king. He must have been an absolutely electric, extraordinary person. Um, his inspiration, uh, uh, what he, how he succeeds, is vital to Bruce. I suppose um, ultimately um, Bruce was ashamed of Wallace because the Bruce never mentions Wallace. I think Wallace would have gladly served Bruce as uh, outlined in the book. I think that uh, if Bruce had bent the knee to the common um, we could have avoided three years of conflict. Um, I think David II uh, was a disaster, um, so I, we might have avoided the Second Wars of Independence, or at least their scale, if we'd actually had uh, a common royal family. And of course, I still, th uh, um, and I think we're all agreed that Balliol was a mistake. Um, but if the Common, the Bruce, and Wallace had all backed John Balliol, perhaps, but the Red Common was starting to call himself um, King of Scotland just before um, Bruce killed him in under a flag of truce on holy ground in Dumfries. Anyway, so <laughs> maybe a longer answer than you thought. Um, so third question and final question. We hear a lot about how Wallace and Bruce lived in grandeur and in hiding, but what was life like for the average citizen of Stirling at the time? Well, um, absolutely horrible. Um, we still have slavery. Um, most people, um, I, you, your and I's great, 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 great grandparents are probably peasants, if not serfs. Average life expectancy, late thirties, early forties, um, and considerably um, lower because of the war. Um, between thirteen o four and thirteen fourteen, Stirling is an English garrison town. Um, think of children born, think of compromises made, um, trade has to carry on, uh, people have to eat, you have to acquiesce with the authorities. And um, Is this something like Vichy France and the Nazis? Um, of course the English aren't the Nazis but in terms of occupation, um, what happens after 1314, uh, after, after June 1314, the Bannock Burn? Um, are women shaved? Are they beaten? Um, you know, we know Philip Mowbray um, joins Bruce's side um, and um, eventually dies in Ireland. But there are so many comings and goings. Um, his brother, Philip Mowbray's brother, um, is involved in the Souls Prot and 
I think his corpse is dug up and tried. Um, divided loyalties are what the uh, and divided family loyalties and brother against brother, cousin against cousin, are what the wars of independence are about. Um, coming specifically to Sterling, um, I don't know how people coped. Um, Bruce has to deploy a scorched earth policy. Remember, Stirling Castle is destroyed the day after Bannockburn. Um, and ahead of the 1319 and 1322 invasions, um, he does the same thing again. Um, the net result of the war, and indeed the Second War of Independence, is repeated destruction, depopulation, and a collapse in the tax returns, um, uh, which dropped by 60% compared to before the war. Um, the locals protest against the virtual monopoly on the salmon fishery, uh, in the fourth, uh, one of the richest in Europe at the time, and they destroy the um, the the fish traps of the Abbey and the King. At this point, David the Second comes down in favour of the Abbey, um, and of course we have to realise that Bruce doesn't rebuild Stirling Castle. It's actually the English. Um, they they kind of rebuild on the ruins in the wars of the Second Wars of Independence. Um, I don't think Bruce trusts. Sterling, um, or I don't think he trusts the location, perhaps, um, and he rebuilds north of the Forth at Clackmannan. Um, I mean, Wallace and Bruce always found the uh, the Forth the most reliable ally, um, and I mean that goes all the way back to the early kings of Alapa, um, Macbeth, um, Malcolm the Third, um, etc., etc., etc. The core of Scotland is in north of the Forth. Yeah, as late as the fifteenth century, Stirling is described as being on the border with England. Um, and of course, what we mean by that are the Lothians and um, mid uh, to the southwest. Glasgow is a separate British kingdom. Uh, Strathclyde, um, Manow, of course, is the name of the British kingdom round Stirling, but um, it's it, it's gone centuries before um, it just gets ravaged because it's the the key crossing point um, uh, and it continues to be I mean it, it's it's like a military transit zone um, think of the demilitarized zone in um, North Korea or the boundary on um, Cyprus between the Greek Cypriots and the Turkish Cypriots you know um, maybe not literally as uh, uh, as a no man's land as that but certainly a place where you might expect to be raided left, right and centre. Um, anyway, I hope you enjoyed the lecture. I hope you enjoyed the answers to the questions. And um, uh, stay safe and hopefully come and visit Stirling or read the poetry. Uh, thank you very much. Bye for now.